Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Free the Truth seminar. Um, my name is Deepa Govindaraj and Driver, along with my colleague, Professor Ian Munro, who's on the panel today. Um, we're here to discuss and uh, mark the ninth year since the Strat 4 or the Global Intelligence Files were released. And um, on our panel today, we have three fantastic um, panelists. We have Dr. Suelet Dreyfus, who's a tech researcher and a whistleblowing expert. Hi, Suelet. Um, we have John Kiriakou, who is uh, well known as the CIA torture whistleblower. And we have uh, Lauri Love, who um, is uh, well known as a hacktivist and an expert on all things uh, information technology. And of course, we have Professor Ian Mundro, whistleblowing expert and um, founder, co-founder of Free the Truth. In terms of today's uh, session, um, our, this webinar is being um, transmitted by on the DEA uh, channels, as well as um, by a, a number of other sources. We're also very grateful to Consortium News who are reporting on this event and streaming it through their Twitter channel. Um, a big thank you to the Committee to Defend Julian Assange, whose grassroots supporters have contributed towards the cost of the Zoom, uh, and as they have done in ordinary times outside of COVID to the costs of the hall that we used to book. We have speakers today from across the world, across from Australia to America, um, and we're going to talk about issues that affect both the Global South and the Global North. And, um, as we go into this, one of the things that um, I, that sticks in my head is Mike Pompeo talking about um, WikiLeaks being a hostile non-state intelligence service. And it, it seems quite apt that it was this hostile non-state intelligence service that was supposedly abetting the government of Russia that at, uh, nine years ago um, through the ingenuity of people like Julian Assange and those who were behind WikiLeaks brought to light the way in which a private, unaccountable firm was um, essentially engaging in all kinds of activity, including bribery and, um, and manipulation. To, uh, and would it literally stop at nothing, including uh, in order to boost its bottom line, such, so that it kept information a privileged commodity that was only available to the few. And this was, of course, highly manipulated, um, tailored information. And rather than, a, uh, rather than a source of knowledge and information for the many, which is what WikiLeaks sought to do. And WikiLeaks, of course, did this through being pioneering in offering what was an electronic drop box, so to speak, for whistleblowers that provided anonymity both to the source as well as to, as well as a certain level of security for the documentation. A level of security that means that to this day, WikiLeaks has a 100% record of accuracy. Um, in, in contrast, what this private intelligence firm Stratfor was doing was um, providing information to governments, to, um, to the Marines, to lots of um, quite dubious uh, regimes around the world, as well as to companies like Dow Chemicals. And the, for example, with Dow, the, they were reporting information in relation to activists uh, who, were, who were reeling from the Bhopal gas tragedy in India in Madhya Pradesh, where um, you know so many people, over five hundred thousand people, were injured as a result of a gas leak. And I, I always remember the story of this particular trade unionist, a worker who um, was carrying a gas called phosgene in a in a container and um, managed to drop it on himself and then pulled off the mask, uh, the gas mask that he was wearing and died within 72 hours of inhaling this information. Now, not only was Dow involved in uh, this huge tragedy, which went under the Union Carbide overhanging um, company, 
but it also was involved in uh, contaminating the water after that. And um, Stratfor was also in involved in, um, in, the, in, in relation to the Vancouver Olympics on advising Coca-Cola about PETA activists and what they were involved in. So for those of you who are activists sitting in the audience wondering what Julian Assange's case has to do with you, a lot of what WikiLeaks revealed was about the ways in which governments and private actors were colluding to, um, to, re to, to essentially clamp down on activism, on whistleblowing, on um, the public's right to know. Now, Strat4 uh, quite uh, interestingly describes itself, and I'm trying to read the words here, as, a, as the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Um, and this geo world leading geopolitical intelligence platform is actually trying to make money for a small bunch of shareholders. And it is actually public money that is being used in the pursuit of many of the activities that um, Stratfor is trying to get into, which are quite to a large extent disconnected from the sociopolitical and economic realities of the jurisdictions in which companies like Stratfor operate. Um, in a way, what they do is um, entrench some of the structural inequalities, including racism, um, that that comes from the kinds of uh, perverted information that is leaked in relation to some of these sources. And when governments and in intelligence agencies and public bodies rely on this kind of information, which is flawed, biased, and often inaccurate, um, and where the customers of this information within these governments often become assets, often become people who work within intelligence firms like Stratfor. It, uh, it creates a situation where the, uh, the people who are using these inf this information or the people who are providing this information are largely unaccountable to the ordinary public while benefiting hugely from public money. And this is something that many of you, especially those of you who are interested in uh, holding the state accountable for its criminality will be really interested in. So I'd like to um, stop there and invite our first speaker, John Kiriakou, to tell us a little bit about what, for those of us who don't know very much about what firms like Stratfor do, could you tell us about who they are, what they do, what their kinds of clients are, and how this affects um, you know, the, the quality of the intelligence that we get? Over to you, John. Certainly, thank you. Thanks for having me. First, uh, first off, uh, I'm very happy to talk about Strat4 uh, because I think it's a very important issue that most people uh, don't talk about. It's certainly an issue here in Washington. Um, and I've always gotten a little bit of a kick out of the conversation about Strat4 because I never took Strat4 seriously as a serious organization. And frankly, I don't know any intelligence professional uh, that did or that does. Stratfor, the, the joke about Stratfor for many years has been uh, about Stratfor's so-called secret sources. They talk about what a great intelligence platform they are because they have these sources all over town. Well, the joke is that their sources are the press officers of every uh, embassy in the city. And, uh, and their other special sources are the Washington Post and the New York Times. So really what Stratfor is, what Stratfor has always been, is a group of um, underpaid, very attractive young women, and we can talk about that separately if you'd like, uh, because that's who George Friedman, the, the co-founder of Stratfor, always hired, was very attractive young women. Um, sitting around and reading newspapers and uh, watching CNN and MSNBC and jotting down notes and then calling the embassy of Yemen or the embassy of Saudi Arabia, the embassy of Jordan and talking to the press officer there and then writing up a report like it's some special secret insight that nobody else could possibly come to. Um, and that's why when Jeremy Hammond, God bless him, uh, did what he did, I was so shocked at the way the boom was lowered on him because he didn't reveal anything. He didn't reveal anything that was dangerous. What he did though was expose a very Washington kind of phoniness 
that, uh, that was Stratfor and its business model. Now, what firms like Stratfor try to do, what they try to market is a certain level of political and strategic insight that nobody else has. Uh, what they say is that they're full of former CIA people, former NSA people, former FBI people. That's just simply not true. They can't afford those people. So they hire these young college graduates, um, researchers, uh, writers to just press pieces and uh, send out their bulletins. Um, mostly their subscribers were individuals. Now they brag or they used to brag on their website about how their subscribers were mostly Fortune 500 companies. That was largely not true. Uh, they were mostly individuals, LLCs, sole proprietorships with very specific questions. Should I do business in Yemen? Should I buy that, uh, that silver mine in Romania? Uh, and then you would need to know things like, well, if I do want to buy that silver mine in Romania, uh, who's going to win the next election? The conservatives who are going to let me mine the silver or the socialists who are going to not let me mine the silver? And, and that's it. This was, all about, this was all about capitalism. It was all about making money. It wasn't about strategic thinking. It wasn't about long-term prognostication. It wasn't about secret clandestine sources. This was all about money. And that's why Stratford didn't pay its people anything because it was all about money for the principles and putting money into the pockets of those people who had negotiated favorable terms with the government and with other investors. So in my view, Stratfor has always just been a fake, phony, underachieving organization whose sole purpose was to make money for its initial investors. It provided nothing to the greater context of intelligence collection or intelligence analysis uh, in Washington or even in the business community. Thanks, John. Uh, can I just stay with you there and ask you to tell us a little bit about how um, organizations like Stratfor, if they are, you know, I, I heard somebody describe them as half clown, half intelligence agency. <laughs> and, uh, and I was really curious if, if they are indeed who, who, as described, why is it that they are so powerful? Could you tell us a little bit about that and also yeah. about your general understanding of how their information is used by organizations within the establishment um, in addition to, you know, in addition to furthering cap cap the interests of capitalists? Sure, let me answer your, your uh, sequ second question first. The information um, is used by insiders to, to either confirm or to refute the information that the insiders have because their sourcing is gonna be different. Um, insiders, you know, at the CIA, we had this mantra and it was uh, recruit spies to steal secrets, period. That's how you get promoted by recruiting spies to steal secrets. Um, Stratfor doesn't recruit spies to steal secrets, that's espionage, and they don't have diplomatic immunity or diplomatic cover to protect themselves, so they don't steal the secrets. They just read the papers and analyze uh, the, the media and see if the, if the results uh, are the same as what the, the intelligence organizations are, uh, are getting in their own analysis. So that's easy. It's just to either refute or to support uh, conclusions based on different sourcing. Uh, how did they get started? Well, you know, every retiring or former CIA officer, especially from the Directorate of Intelligence, which is the analytic um, organization inside the CIA, wants to keep doing what he's doing. See, at the CIA, part of the culture is to convince you that your job is so specialized that you can't do anything else right? You can't market that skill outside the CIA. And that's one of the reasons why turnover is so low at the CIA. It's actually under 2% and has been for decades. Uh, it's because they convince you that you can't do anything else. Where are you going to go? You're going to go to the Washington Post? 
you can't because then everything that you write has to be cleared by the CIA. You'll, get, you'll never get anything published. So what you do if you do leave the CIA is you create an organization like Stratfor or join an organization like Stratfor, which is trying to do exactly what the CIA has always been doing, but without the sourcing. So like I say, it's, it's an empty shell of, of what a real intelligence organization uh, would do. Thanks, John. Uh, Lowry, thank you very much for being here. Um, could you tell us a little bit, a lot of what we're talking about in relation to the Stratfor Leagues also has uh, a lot to do with um, the work done by Anonymous. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the hacktivism that sits alongside um, these leaks and what what the people who were involved and what the circumstances that were uh, surrounding this were about. Uh, Lowry, you're still muted. I'm just going to make sure you're unmuted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I can try and fill in a little bit of those blanks. Um, unfortunately, the passage of time and the several assaults on my um, brain <laughs> made it harder to remember the exact details. But um, yeah, the 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 way um, Stratfor came into my radar as an online activist um, exploring how to do activism online, um, uh, the, the modalities of activism and the emergence of Anonymous as this kind of network, decentralized, chaotic actor, that, um, the, the internet developing a conscience and trying to um, exert the power of the network to try and make the world a better place. Um, it came on our radar because um, we we found out that there was a dirty tricks campaign against us and, and not just us um, a dirty tricks campaign against um, online activists against WikiLeaks against uh, Glenn Glenn Greenwald and some other journalists who were reporting on information um, that was coming out of online activities and this um, this idea that that this was something that could be solved by um, the right kind of strategic uh, interventions and. Um, so Strat4 um, were implicated with H.P. Gary and Palantir and some other of these private sector intelligence um, adjuncts, shall we say, um, in um, attempting to disrupt these activities. Sim similarly to how you uh, mentioned earlier, Deepa, the um, um, activism uh, to do with the, uh, the, the, the chemical uh, atrocities um, in India um, and attempts to um, kind of uh, nail nail that activism and control it. Um, a similar thing was uh, was um, being perpetrated against this new emergent um, tendency of online protest. And um, you know, as, as John said, the, the these these were not professionals. These are you know cowboys in a clown car um, uh, selling um, Lisa Simpson's magic rock that makes the tigers go away. And you, know, you don't see any tigers here, so the rock must work. And then you can get away with this because if you claim to just have a little bit of intelligence, then maybe a few law firms or a few other firms are going to hedge their bets because they just want to, you know, uh, potentially get that bit of intelligence before making the wrong business decision, etc. In some part of the world that they don't have full insight into. But um, the, the 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 actual activities that were exposed were, um, yeah, I mean it's. To, to say that they were they were not contributing to strategic analysis or or, or um, pro prognostication or, or planning is uh, is too diplomatic. They <laughs> they were um, people trying to make a quick buck by being the cyber version of the Pinkertons, you know, um, some ad adjunct to the state that can come in and um, fr throw a little muscle around and act very unprofessionally and try and ensure that things go the way that they ought to go. Thanks, Laurie. Uh while we're with you, could you tell us a little bit about what motivates the kinds of people who get involved in anonymous and who are who are seeking to reveal such information before we go on to Sualette to talk a little bit about how that differs from whistleblowing or how that is similar to whistleblowing. So um, are you able to tell us a little bit about anonymous and what what kinds of uh, people get involved, why they get involved? what what motivates them what kind of acti um, activism they're involved in etc i mean speaking solely through the lens of my own um, perspective and my own experiences um, the the emergence of this um, entity anonymous or this um, 
collective dynamic of, of people on the internet um, was uh, a liberating and empowering um, uh, pivotal change in how people that were on the internet or some small subsection of them were able to view their ability to relate to the world and it's not just um, a place that you go to escape these things that you you were never really particularly uh, on board with but it's uh, a means by which you can actually um, envision a better world and try and bring it about and it was um, it was vastly liberating even um, small sim symbolic uh, gestural token actions such as helping um, uh, protesters out who were uh, being suppressed by authoritarian regimes um, or revealing information about um, corporate and civic uh, malfeasance in, in, in office. Um, it, it suddenly became apparent that, that there was a, a power here for a large number of people collaboratively to exercise a, a form of oversight, I would say, that, that hadn't emerged previously. Um, and, and we were playing around with that role and, and what, what our ability um, could be to, 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 um, to agitate for justice in that capacity. Thanks, Lauri. Um, I, I, I wonder if we could now move to Suelet to talk to you a little bit about um, what, what it means to hold power to account and how whistleblowers do that and where the boundaries lie between um, those who are outside the organization and those who are inside the organization when they whistleblow and also perhaps also talk a little bit about um, how this relates to the case of Julian Assange and um, the current situation in relation to how um, the state is going after him. So over to you Suelet. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, we had this anniversary on the February 27th, 2012, WikiLeaks uh, began publishing the you know, global intelligence files of over 5 million emails uh, from the Texas headquarters of this company. Um, and, uh, and the emails were from 2004 to December 2011. Um, and this, this act was one of a number of acts in the activities of WikiLeaks that have really helped um, expand the definition of whistleblower. So traditionally, um, whistleblower has sort of evolved really from the 1980s uh, and 1990s as being primarily about employees revealing serious wrongdoing, often fraud, financial fraud, from inside a company. But what we've seen is uh, a movement over the last decade, and, and WikiLeaks was certainly a major causative factor in this, to broadening that definition. Uh, and, and that now includes in many definitions, uh, many protections, uh, contractors, subcontractors. Uh, it's now been expanded to say volunteer board members of a church or a school. Um, and so these are people who are not just employed by or subjugated, if you will, by a boss in the organization, but have some role in that community. Uh, increasingly, I've seen debate uh, in academic circles about whether or not university students might be considered whistleblowers by virtue of being inside a university community, even though they don't hold a official role as an employee or an oversight person like a board manager. For those people who are entirely outside of a community and again, the lines of community blur in an electronic setting. Um, but for those people who are outside, entirely outside of an organization, um, the term that I and some other academics have used to describe uh, people who reveal serious wrongdoing is, is bell ringers. And uh, bell ringers, and particularly public interest bell ringers, which I think you would say this, uh, the people who provided this information to WikiLeaks as a publisher to publish, or acting in the public interest. Um, and we can talk about what it's revealed in the public interest. Um, both of those sorts of people need protections and particularly one of the things that they need protection from is a kind of um, ugly threat that's been emerging uh, from the onward push towards better protection for whistleblowers. And so that better protection has been exemplified by a huge growth over the last decade um, in the number of laws and um, implementations of policy that protect whistleblowers, including by the end of 2021, um, some 27 countries in the European Union who will all have to adopt a minimum standard set of laws in national transposition of the EU directive protecting whistleblowers. This is a, a massive thing, it's fantastic. Um, 
So, uh, so why, you know, why is this important? Well, you've seen this move, but there are threats to this move. And one of the, th you know, threats to it is a risk that whistleblowers, and we've seen this in Julian Assange's case uh, and in other cases, will be charged with data misuse or um, uh, unauthorized access of data uh, charges. And, and that this will be the side door channel that is used to attack the whistleblower or, uh, or someone who reveals the, you know, makes a disclosure in the public interest. Well, why is that? Um, okay, it's because most things are actually stored in electronic form these days. And they're, you know, the, we aren't reverting to paper very much. And so a lot of the computer misuse acts um, internationally have a very broad scope. Uh, and they basically refer to either using any telecommunications, uh, you know, facility. Well, we all use those every day. They follow us around like tracking devices with our phones, um, at, you know, or, or any online uh, technology or any data that's stored in a, a technological um, basis. So that, you know, that is a, that's a pretty serious concern. Um, uh, that's a threat to, to the whistleblower and the kind of general movement that happened from 2010 to now. And that is a push towards more transparency. So I think one thing that's really important about the role of public interest bell ringers, as well as whistleblowers, and this is an emerging thing that has happened uh, really over the last uh, decade to 15 years, is that um, we once in our, in our free and open democracies believed that uh, transparency was a corrective mechanism in its own right. So you have FOI laws, for example and freedom of the press. And that's great, but we're drowning in data, right? We have more data. I can't even keep all the files straight on my computer, you know, <laughs> let alone all the other data that's on the internet. We are drowning in data, which is probably why some people pay a lot of money to places like Stratfor. Um, the problem with that is that what's in short supply now is less the data and more the guides and the signposts. And the guides and the signposts are incredibly important. Those that do so in the public interest are doubly so. And so punishing the whistleblower um, or punishing the public interest um, bell ringer uh, is, is taking away that kind of key junction in the process that you need to have a protective umbrella over in the public interest. And that process looks like the whistleblower, the public interest uh, bell ringer to, for example, the journalist, to the publisher, to the public. If you break down any element of that chain, the, the people who lose are the public. Uh, and, and, and we've seen, you know, for example, um, a you know, significant whistleblowing case, uh, Alton Del Tour's uh, case, the LuxLeak case, you know, he was initially charged with uh, a, a computer, he was going to be charged with a computer crimes related uh, charge. And this is not um, unusual at all. So, so I think those, those, that's where we've got a kind of nexus point that's very relevant to, to this case. Um, and uh, I might just add that in terms of some big headline observations about why this case uh, is so important. Um, I mean, the clown's comment is, is quite funny. Uh, you, could, you could make an observation that um, Stratfor uh, you know, we, we thought that they were all connected to the CIA, as John said, but really they were sitting at their desk doing Google searches all day long. Um, and, and, and as John, and, and it's not only a question of the CIA has access to information that obviously they don't have, but CIA actually does operations. They don't just do Google searches, right? So, so um, and that's really, I mean, you could say that's the difference as well between, I don't know, Blackwater and The Economist. Um, so I think it was The Atlantic might have quoted someone uh, at the time that the Stratfor uh, uh, documents were published saying something like um, what you got in the intelligence reports from Stratfor is what you could have gotten from the economist uh, the week before um, you know and uh, and I think you know the observation that Stratfor has paid sources which came out of this is interesting because I think I believe the Atlantic also said uh, yes we have people like that they're called reporters um, and, <laughs> and but the difference is their reports go to the public um, so the, the, that those are kind of my observations on on this. Thank you, Suelet. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd just like to move very briefly, if I may, to introduce Professor Ian Munro, who is um, one of the co-founders of uh, Free the Truth, and to ask if Ian, would you like to add to this discussion of whistleblowing because you are a highly regarded whistleblowing expert, and I wondered whether you wanted to add to 
the comments Suelet, Suelet has just made before we go to questions. Just to warn everybody who's watching in the audience, if you wouldn't mind uh, posting your questions, if you're on the Zoom, if you can post it within the Q&A tab then we can pick it up for, I can pick it up for the speakers. And if you're watching on one of the um, other channels, our, our expert, our tech experts who are beavering on behind the scenes will post them back to me. So hopefully we will capture many of the questions that you want to ask. So if you can please post your questions now while Ian is speaking, then we can try and pass them out to the right speakers. Ian, over to you. Thanks, Deepa, and uh, thanks very much for, for the speakers and their uh, very valuable insights into uh, the Stratfall leaks and more generally into the role of uh, these uh, private security in inverted commas or private intelligence firms, uh, regardless of their uh, competence. Um, and of course, if you read the global intelligence files or some of them, uh, they're riven with prejudice, uh, mistakes, and of course, um, yeah, basic errors, uh, all coming probably from the newspapers that they're reading, I suspect, rather than intelligence work, as this has been pointed out already. Uh, and I would, I would like to, I completely agree with what Sulet just said. Uh, if you think of a whistleblower, Chelsea Manning, uh, she was uh, charged with a whole bunch of things, but she was actually only convicted of uh, computer fraud and misuse. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, three counts, um, oh, so five counts, and put in prison for 35 years. And that what they do, if, uh, what the judge did in that case uh, was, of course, give the maximum possible sentence uh, for a relatively mundane, what well, apparently mundane crime, because they couldn't uh, convict her of anything else because she'd, she'd, she'd done the public interest disclosure. She'd revealed the existence of war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq. <laughs> and um, Julian Assange, of course, is being prosecuted more or less the same thing. Uh, using uh, based on similar laws, except he's being even though he wasn't the whistleblower, he was the uh, pu the published the journalist who handled the disclosures, Chelsea Manning's disclosures. He's up for 175 years, uh, and of course, it's um, as many people have already pointed out, this is uh, criminalization, or not only of whistleblowing, for, uh, but or we on the one hand we've got these new whistleblower laws being created for whistleblower protection, which is all great, uh, but on the other hand. We've got other, other laws being uh, used or misused uh, for uh, very severely um, to try and deter whistleblowers and also whistleblower journalists and uh, people who support whistleblowers. But um, yeah, I think uh, it's a, a very serious problem, not just in, amongst the whistleblowing problem, that the community, but also in the activist community more generally. I, I think last year or the year before last, Amnesty International produced uh, a major report on the role of uh, private intelligence uh, firms that were tracking activists, its activists, and uh, I think they particularly focused on a firm called the uh, NSO. Um, but this is obviously a growing problem, and I remember, as well as WikiLeaks, um, I remember um, Mr. Um, Robert Thibault raising the issue that activists were being tracked by the intelligence community as well, um, journalists and so on. And uh, he gave the example of a of a police whistleblower in, in Canada. Um, and the journalist was being, was asked by the um, Canadian police force to, can, can you get information on, on this, on the journalist so we can find out who, our, who the whistleblower is. But uh, yeah, I, I think that um, this is a serious problem. I just wanna, um, even though the company as it were strapped for maybe uh, clownish and not particularly professional or, um, um, if you look at UC Global, of course, that's that was that seems to have had much more of a an effect, as it were, in, in the sense that it seems to be have had more very close links with US intelligence and also with um, the type of information, you know, surveying lawyers, uh, journalists, um, whistleblowers, anyone talking to Wik uh, WikiLeaks staff, and also possibly. Um, providing information or misinformation, which is then being circulated in the uh, within the media. But I, I was just wondering what. In, in, I would like to, to ask the question of the speakers: What do you do about it? Um, how do you? Uh, in the, of course, in a brilliant in the H. B. Gary case, an anonymous basically revealed um, how incompetent H. B. Gary was, and that this led to a decline in its reputation and, and its insolvency. 
but uh, how do we deal with this? How do we address this uh, this issue? Does anyone have any of the speakers have any particular? Um, I could I could jump in at this point. Um, I I think we actually ought to take seriously Mike Pompeo's um, suggestion of what the world needs, and that that is a public intelligence agency that is not beholden to the uh, partisan interests of a particular region or a particular corporation or a particular demographic, um, but is beholden to the interests of humanity at large. And um, the reason we need to have a public distributed decentralized intelligence agency is because as Sulet said, our grievous, uh, our, our, our responsibility, our duty um, to act as the overseers of power um, which is uh, of um, in a, in, in, inestimable importance for a civic society. It's the reason we have a, a court uh, in public. It's the reason why the, the king deliberates at the court in public. It's the reason why the administration of law is done in public. It's the reason why democracy is done transparently and publicly as far as possible. Um, and that's because power, when it is not uh, under oversight that is effective uh, tends inevitably towards corruption um, and uh, unpleasant things happen. And the problem is we, it's not a lack of information that we have, it's a lack of ability to analyze that information, and understand the import. And so we need to, um, we need to bootstrap the um, structures um, so that the, the public can continue to, to, to see what is being done um, with the power that is ceded, we must remember this, that all power is ceded by the public to governments and to private corporate entities, etc., uh, to ensure that they are not um, crossing some lines in the sand that we should, you know, uh, uh, retain the right to draw. And I think we've lost that. And as we transfer into this digital age, we, we have to think to ourselves very carefully, how do we continue to uh, have that uh, for faculty to uh, exercise that oversight and for that we need um, entities like WikiLeaks but it's not just the ability to source documents and to to get to offer source protections and to publish them without fear or favor but it's also a meaningful analysis um, and implications and and so this speaks to the way that um, whistleblowing and bell ringing and in, intellect so fantastic um, extension of that analogy um, become now an integral part of the role of journalism in society that, that it's inextricable. It's not, not no longer just this um, uh, separate class of journalists whose job it is to, to report on the news, but anyone in any position where they interact with a system where some information about the inner workings of that system is necessary to be known by the greater greater whole um, now puts on the hat of that 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 duty to disclose. And we need to make it as frictionless, um, we need to eliminate all the barriers of entry to do that. We need to make it safe and we need to make it effective because without that, um, power will continue to uh, tend towards um, tyranny. Thanks, Lowry. Um, I, there are a couple of questions which are surfacing in the chat. And before we um, go into that, what, one of the things that it's worth probably picking up is a question about, um, Julian and the way, you know, Lowry talked about holding power to account and um, how a democracy works and how it should be transparent and how we should understand that the, the justice system works in a reasonable way. And I'd like to go to Suelet and Lowry um, to talk to them a little bit about um, so let, could you tell us about how this timeline of the Stratfall League sits with the broader timeline of um, Julian's indictments and particularly could you focus on the way the the superseding indictments were introduced and explain that a little bit to us because I think a lot of people don't understand um, the problems with due process not just in terms of companies like Stratfor um, planning to hold hold Julian as one of the as, as some of the leaks revealed as a keep him as a bride in prison move him from country to country um, so to talk about these things, but then also perhaps go to Lowry and talk about a little bit about what the extradition process feels like. So, because although this um, webinar is essentially commemorating the Stratfor leaks, I think we have to also talk about the organization and the people who were involved in, um, in bringing the information that was of, of public interest to light and how much 
many of them have lost and have sacrificed in order for us to be able to know what's really going on. Whereas the people who are the war criminals, the Bush, the, the Bushes, the Blairs, the, um, the Obamas of this world are putting out new books and sitting free and enjoying their lives. So I, I think we do have to talk about what's happening in Julian's case and what's happening um, in Belmarsh prison where uh, Julian, you know, he's been given his warm clothes in October or rather they've been sent into him and yet the prison hasn't delivered them to him and he's been sitting freezing cold preparing for the trial of his life and um, this really brings a sense of urgency to our discussion. So over to you Suelet, if you can tell us a little bit about the second superseding indictment and the broader timeline and then we'll go to Lowry about the extradition process. Yeah, I mean, um, so you know, Julian is dragged out of uh, the embassy. There are initial charges laid against him in, in April 2019. Um, and this has been due to a change of government uh, in Ecuador and the US actively, actively lobbying Ecuador and being instrumental in, in raising billions of dollars of loans uh, to Ecuador um, uh, with, I think, you know, one of the price tags being Julian Assange. So in late May 2019, the you know, Espionage Act charges are unveiled against Julian. And normally when those charges are uh, unveiled, that's, that's the last word. And that's because um, the UK, as the kind of um, men in the middle of all this, has to go through a set of processes to start this proceeding because he's not being tried for these crimes in the UK. He's being, you know, the debate is one of extradition, not whether or not he's guilty of those particular crimes at this time. So the hearing opens itself in February 2020. Um, and uh, that's because the US is pushing to speed things up. They want things to happen quickly. Um, and, you know, there are a set of hearings that are held. And then in June 2020, June 24, all of a sudden the US is like, well, actually, we've got additional charges that we want laid. And the charge sheet is superseding, hence the name superseding indictment, um, the previous charges. So it replaces the previous indictment. Now, this is so confusing to the process and probably unprecedented uh, in the um, UK extradition proceedings that have gone before for anyone. It's certainly in my knowledge, I don't know of any case where this has been done sort of halfway through when the, the, the cake is half baked, um, uh, that the UK is, is floundering around for four to six weeks after this has happened um, uh, because they don't know what to do with it. They're not sure how to process it. It's actually a very um, outrageous thing for the USD DOJ to have done at that time. Um, and, and at the time, these, these superseding indictment, this list of new charges uh, are just kind of plonked on the um, website of the DOJ. No articles, no fanfare, just one day it kind of appears. Um, it, who knows, possibly that was how uh, the, the UK government learned about it. We don't know. But, um, it, you know, from then September, there is uh, the hearing and uh, Julian Assange is, you know, formally readdressed and, re you know, on these new charges. Now, you just wouldn't normally do that. It's not, it's not normal behavior. Um, uh, and he's now not having the opportunity to respond properly to a set of these new charges, which is completely outrageous in the justice system where he's about to be extradited. So uh, not having the challenge, not having the opportunity to challenge um, these new allegations is, is really an abuse of process. Um, uh, but um, that's what has gone on here. It's possible that um, the judge took a very dim view of this. Uh, in a sense, it's an insult to the British justice system. I don't think you could describe it as anything else. It treats the British justice system with a kind of contempt. Um, and, and I suspect that most British judges would take a dim view of that. Um, so uh, so that's, that's where, you know, that's where his case is, you know, is at, at the moment. Obviously, the um, Biden administration has decided to appeal the finding of the lower court, which uh, had what many people in civil society would, would argue is a very bad set of um, decisions for freedom of the press and freedom of expression uh, and human rights. 
right up until the point in the decision where the judge rules not to extradite him, but really on the grounds of, uh, of his mental health. So, um, you know, I'm not ruling, I'm not saying he's not bad, but he's mad and therefore we won't extradite him. You know, it's, it's kind of smeared, um, but at least he's not extradited. But uh, the US didn't have to actually um, fight those. They could have just said, it's gonna be a hard fight on legal grounds and therefore it's a waste of taxpayers, taxpayers' monies. And by the way, we have a whole new administration. Do we really wanna spend the next years chasing the ghosts of the last four years administration? Uh, and so they could have just decided to not proceed with that. Instead, they have decided to do so. So it will be interesting to see um, what happens. I think one of the important things that has come out of Julian's case, but it's also come out of um, you know, the other cases related to it, for example, Jeremy Hammond's case, um, Chelsea Manning's case, uh, is, a, is the biggest kind of existential threat to the nature of investigative journalism that we've seen in a long time. And that threat looks like this. Where you have uh, a journalist who finds information, a tip off that there is serious wrongdoing that is happening. It may be illegal, uh, it may be just immoral, it may offend the public mores. And they ask for the disclosure of that information, whether it's a public interest bell ringer or a whistleblower for some evidence in, in support of that allegation. There is a tilt in the kinds of charges that have been um, laid against the people involved in this you know, decade long saga. And that tilt is to ask for that evidence is becoming a criminalized act. It is criminalizing the act of verification. And it's very ironic because many politicians around the world stand on their soapbox uh, and say, oh my God, it's terrible. You know, Facebook publishes fake news. It's awful, awful, awful. But here you actually have something that will undermine the verification of the accuracy of news in reporting. Um, but it, it creates a terrible precedent. It's bad for the whistleblower and integrity in society and the organization, and it's bad for journalism. Uh, and the last thing you wanna have is journalists who don't ask for evidence because then they're going to print things that are simply wrong. I, I think we saw some of that when um, either because of um, journalists who choose not to ask for evidence or journalists who view the evidence only through a particular lens when they are, for example, embedded journalists doing war journalism. And um, like the journalist who was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who was unwilling to reveal what happened within the collateral murder with video until um, WikiLeaks revealed it and Chelsea's testimony came through and it became more and more evident that he knew about this information. So, um, yes, it is, it, it is really worrying, isn't it, to see how evidence gathering and the, the process by which we can penetrate some of the, um, the complexity and the opacity of these kinds of very complex institutions which make very important decisions about our lives. And yet we have very little control over and where individuals in these institutions are hiding behind these facades to essentially um, enrich themselves, whether it is shareholders of Stratfor or whether it is the owners of uh, organizations such as these who are, um, who are hiring intelligence people who are sitting within the establishment who then come over and make money for themselves. Um, but just to take a step back before we go into uh, perhaps with you a little bit, John, uh, in a second about how companies like Stratfor smear people and what kinds of information the, the leaks actually revealed. Um, could I come back to Lowry and what I wanted to talk about this idea of holding power to account and um, we we saw on the screen flashing by for those of you who were watching the live stream, um, the information provided by Declassified UK, which showed that uh, there are serious questions about conflicts of interest in relation to Lady Emma Arbuthnot, who's the chief, who was the chief magistrate at Westminster Magistrates Court. And um, how you know her son is involved with a company called Dark Trace, which seeks to shut down places like WikiLeaks. How her husband has a um, has a is is partnering with Sir Richard Dearlove in relation to 
things and how she herself receives financial benefits from secretive partner organizations of the UK Foreign Office. And, um, you know, looking at that and looking at, for example, a judge uh, at uh, a hearing where Ju Julian is called in front of the court, he says his name and his date of birth and the judge brands him a narcissist. What does it feel like to go through this extradition process, particularly if you are somebody perhaps on the um, autism spectrum who is um, expecting certainty? My understanding from the work of Professor Niels Meltzer, the UN Special Rapporteur, who has confirmed that Julian was being exposed to psychological torture, is that a big part of psychological torture is the arbitrariness of the process and also the, um, the inability to rely on institutions that are supposed to protect you. For example, in Julian's case, he sought asylum, he was granted asylum, and then without grounds his citizenship was revoked and without due process similarly um you know when he goes to the court everybody else gets treated a certain way he gets treated differently when he in fact the law has to be changed after the case is taken in julian's case in order to um, make the european extradition warrants for example uh, run in an appropriate way or whether it is in relation to um, you know, the, the treatment as Westminster Magistrates Court. And I say this as somebody who was um, a legal observer at Julian's hearings and how, how, how difficult it was to attend those hearings and how we were intentionally kept out of the process so that, you, you know, the, the right of the public to know as much as it, it is a right of Julian to have a, a, um, an extradition hearing or a, or a judicial process where, uh, the public can understand what's going on in his case was totally trampled over in this case. So um, I'd like to move back to Lowry, please, and talk to you a little bit about your experience of the extradition process and um, what it feels like in terms of this arbitrariness within the process, please. Over to you, Lowry. Thank you, Diva. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 if you haven't had the... Um, wonderful opportunity in your lives yet to read Franz Kafka, I, I suggest you do. Um, he, he wrote a book called The Trial, and um, from that and some of his other writings, we have this adjective in the English language, Kafkaesque, and Kafkaesque basically means, um, well, how can you describe it? It's a, uh, a system um, of administration of so-called justice or law that is um, that is arbitrary, that is undermining, that is um, to some extent gaslighting the people that are involved in it. Um, because of all the expectations that uh, things should proceed a certain way, that there should be a sort of bare fairness, a bare, bare um, equality to it. Um, you see these evaporate as you participate in the system. And it can be small things such as the, when you're put into Westminster Magistrates Court, you are um, you're not allowed, able to sit with counsel. You're not able to confer with counsel and um, help them represent you, as is their brief, as is their responsibility, and as is your right to inform them. You're put in a little goldfish bowl, um, effectively segregated from the rest of the court, and presented to the court as a guilty party. And um, you know, Select reminded us that the trial is not to establish guilt. The 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 judges in an extradition hearing should not allow themselves to form an opinion on the guilt of the or, or non-guilt of the requested person. However, we see that it colors their decision-making um, the way that the United States in particular, because of our unbalanced extradition treaty with the US is able to completely set the stage and frame the narrative and steal a march on the storytelling by the way the, um, the allegations are put together in the indictments that form the extradition. Uh, request and then as, as Sulet said they can somehow late in the game just decide to wipe that slate and put a whole bunch of new things on there and um, the problem in, a, in an extradition hearing is you don't have a right to contest any of these claims I'll say that again for the people at the back you, you are sitting in a goldfish bowl in the dock being lied about by the most powerful organization in the world the most powerful entity in the world indirectly the, the sole remaining superpower in the world in front of a institution that in theory um, administers justice under truth, that administers justice under truth, that uh, ensures the outcome by ensuring truth to ensure that justice is done. You said and you listen to people lie about you 
and you can't even raise your hand and say, please, miss, please, lady, I've, I've met, not to impugn any of our judiciary in particular, but please, can these um, people I haven't met from another country I've never been to stop lying about me so that they can lock me up in a small box for the rest of my life? Because that isn't the way I was raised to believe courts should work. There should be an adversarial process of contesting evidence and um, a, <laughs> an impartial panel of people who are not part of the establishment, the same political entity that is embroiled in the uh, abuses of power that you are bringing to light. And there should be that, at least that check and balance. And all of these things are not there in the extradition process. So it is a little bit like you're being served a meal of justice, but there's, there's no, there's no nu nutrients in there. There's just, um, um, there's just psychological torture. Um, and um, it's not a pleasant process to be put through. And it, this is why it's so essential to have the, um, have other people involved not to to um, exempt themselves as passive observers, but to actually participate as, as you attempted to do deeper as a um, observer, legal observer in this process. And so many other fantastic organizations around the world have attempted to do to say, hold on a minute, you can't can't get away with this. Like we, 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 we are here to watch and ensure that what's done is right. And every effort has been made um, in uh, Julian's case to um, obstruct that oversight faculty again, to, to, to ensure that things can be done in a twisted and underhanded way. Um, and, you know, it's not very pleasant um, for, 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 for anyone. And I can only speak from my own experience, but um, someone of my, shall we say, personality typology, uh, or someone who's in the kind of mold of mindset of viewing the world that I have, um, have a very strong sense of innate justice um, and what is right and then to be to be put into that you know what should be a, a sacred and hallowed place for the administration of that justice and to see its um, integrity and its honor um, besmirched by by the way that process is not um, put together and orchestrated to ensure justice but put together and orchestrated to assure a particular outcome a political outcome um, and that political outcome in this case is the suppression of um, the vital and necessary um, uh, duty of journalists to report the truth without fear, without fear and favour, we say without fear and favour. And you cannot say that anyone who is aspiring to be an investigative journalist or is working at a, a publication in, a, in, the, in the capacity of an editor is not looking at this case and thinking, well, I know where the line is now. I, I know how far I can go and not no, not any further before I, I come under the crosshairs and I have um, myself detained in various forms extra legally for for decade um, subjected to a vile uh, character assassination campaign um, my life made into a sordid so popular mockery um, and, and and facing uh, withering away in a cell for daring to give the public what the public needs to know about things like war crimes, um, things like abuses of power in, in, in detention in Guantanamo, um, all, all of the things that we absolutely must be able to see so that we can say no, <laughs> so that we can say this is not on. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I guess to summarize, um, the extradition process is very, very, very flawed. Um, it, it is a simulacra, it is a simulation of justice in the sense of Baudrillard. Um, it, it, it puts on all of the airs, it puts on all of the um, costumes and it goes through the motions. But when you're sitting there, you can see that it is not uh, bent towards the, 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 the moral arc of this process is not bent towards justice as it should be. Um, and um, you know that's harrowing, and 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 I I'm lucky um, being the first person um, for whom extradition to the United States was refused um, on on the grounds of the foreign bar um, and and that, that it would be unjust and oppressive to put someone um, with any sort of mental uh, uh, physical uh, health complications into such a barbaric system of detention. I was lucky to be able to be here and speak speak to you about this. Um, but these situations haven't 
change. The, the, the detention system is still barbaric. Someone put in there with any psychological difficulties will not flourish. They, they, they will uh, expect to have degradation of their physical and mental condition um, and, uh, and an inability to provide meaningful care to them. Um, and so yeah. we, 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 we're still fighting that battle uh, in Julian's case. Um, and uh, I just want to implore everyone to remember that it's like we're, we're all in this fight. We, we can all play a role. We can all do something, um, even if it's just letting the power know that you are observing. So writing a letter, turning up at court, um, expressing an opinion, sh sh sharing this, discussing it with friends and family and, and say, well, this does concern me. It, it does concern me. I want to live in a world where an organization uh, and a person um, takes great risk and exercises great courage to help the world see what is being done in their name, with the power that they seed, with the money that they uh, give to, to the state. Um, I want to live in a world where that person is not crushed mercilessly to set an example to others that power should not be held to account. So powerful, Laurie. Laurie. And uh, I mean, I, having spoken to you a couple of times, I am um, just moved by what what you have sacrificed and how how deep your sense of justice is and what contribution you have made to the world in being able to do this, and how much um, how much you've been put through, which is completely and so utterly wrong and unjust. Um, Carrying on with this uh, sense of barbarism that you spoke about, um, Julian, if he is extradited to the United States, will face 175 years in a maximum security prison. For those of you who don't know what it feels like to be in the Alexandria Detention Center, um, there is a clip available online, which we will try and uh, share through the chat of what it feels like inside the prison. But in, in, essentially, even at pre-trial stage, this is before any guilt has been established. Um, Julian will be kept in a, a in a very small cell, and um, the U.S. Uh, specializes in these really um, strange terms. For example, Julian will be kept under special administrative measures, which, uh, for anybody who's read the Center for Constitutional Rights report on what they call the darkest corner of the world, special administrative measures are essentially ways in which you are cut off and your lawyers are cut off from speaking to the rest of the world in relation to your trial. Mm -hmm. You are also placed in administrative se segregation as they term it, um, which is essentially solitary confinement where you're in your cell 22 hours a day, which the UN has clearly defined as a form of torture. And as Chelsea, of course, went through this, in fact, she was placed in a cage and at times was deprived of her clothing. And the, the horrendousness of the process doesn't end there. They also talk about, um, you know, one of the things that really bothered me when I was listening to the hearings was the way in which, firstly, the, the, the prosecution, the CPS, talked about mental health and the way in which it was described. And most of this process has been around, you know, described around Julian and his personality rather than in relation to the way in which states are stamping on citizens. But in relation to Julian, they talked about, you know, even the judge talked about his mental health, but actually this is not a case of mental health, but a case of mental injury caused by five states stamping on his head collectively and repeatedly over a period of a decade. Mm -hmm. And it's also about um, how in Julian's case, um, you know, the, the way in which in that court, the United States was trying to pretend as though the US prison system is going to be a holiday where Julian will have career development courses in relation to what he could potentially, you know, he would have access to this particular TV channel, which would train him to think about what he could do once he was released from prison or how to improve his uh, personal skills, which, of course, you know, um, there no, no, no. Um, criticism of prison education, but this was, um, it, in fact, it was worse than any re-education camp you can imagine in some of the worst dictatorships. And um, I know, John, um, in, in terms of your sacrifice, you have been through the US prison system yourself and um, experienced its brutality as 
has uh, Mumia Bujamal, whom we heard from uh, last week and on the Assange defense um, uh, webinar, but also as have the Guantanamo prisoners, many of whom have died in Guantanamo without charge and with never getting due process, including children who were, uh, you know, um, arrested when they were 14 and then committed suicide when they were 21 while still inside Guantanamo. So the US prison system isn't known for um, its, its excessive kindness or its uh, superiority. In fact, the, the rate of suicides in, in the prison population, and particularly those under uh, these extreme solitary confinement measures, is extremely high compared to um, I mean, but what else can you do if you're faced with 175 years where the, you know, at least at the CPS he seemed to keep suggesting they would do everything to keep him alive so they can make sure he goes through the 100 years, whatever is left of his life. So uh, could I move to you, John, uh, after getting off that soapbox about how sure. this is? And could you tell us a little bit? Thank well, you. Where, do, where do I even begin? Uh, there are so many things that are desperately wrong with the U.S. prison system. First of all, everything that you said about solitary confinement is true. The New York Times did a uh, did an expose in the spring of 2016 on one of the maximum security prisons in the state of California. And they talked about how the United Nations has determined that solitary confinement for any length of time beyond 15 days is a form of torture. Well, in the United States, uh, we, we keep prisoners in solitary confinement for as long as 44 years. Now imagine 44 years with no human contact. This New York Times expose in California was talking about a solitary confinement system where you literally have no contact with any other human being. When you receive mail, for example, you don't actually get the mail. There's a computer monitor uh, hanging from the ceiling of your cell, of your six foot by 10 foot cell, out of reach so you can't damage it in any way. They'll put your correspondence on the screen for five minutes, you stand there and read it, and then it's taken off and that's it. The only visitors you're allowed to have are your attorneys, and even they are restricted to once a month. You're allowed one phone call a month. It's monitored, of course, live. You're allowed two showers a week. Your, uh, your meals are provided to you through a slot in the door. And you know when, when we talk about lockdown for 23 hours a day and exercise for one hour a day. It's not really exercise in the conventional uh, definition of the term. Every one of these cells, and I know this because I was in solitary confinement, but every one of these cells has a small door at the back and that door leads to a cage that's outside. Now the cage in my case was another six by 10 feet. And so you can either walk around in a circle or in an oval in your indoor six by 10 cell or one hour a week, I'm sorry, one hour a day, go outside into the cage and walk in a six by 10 foot circle. That's enough to drive the sanest man insane. At this uh, California prison, things got so desperate that prisoners were smashing windows and eating the broken glass just so they could go outside for medical care and speak to another human being. That's what these, these special administrative measures are. Now, there are, there are SAM units within prisons, and then there's a SAM unit that is a prison. That's at the US Penitentiary at Terre Haute, Indiana, where the whistleblower uh, Marty Gottesfeld is currently being held. Presumably, if Julian were to be extradited, and I think he will not be, uh, he would go to the SAM unit at Terre Haute, Indiana. The thing with SAM units, especially at Terre Haute, is the focus is to keep the prisoner away from the media. 
It's all about communication. You know, I was in this modified SAM unit at the, uh, at the US prison in uh, Loretto, Pennsylvania. And I was not permitted to file a Freedom of Information Act request about myself. That was a part of my plea agreement that I could never file a FOIA request ever, ever again in my life. And I thought to myself one day, you know, these people are so stupid just by their nature. They're just stupid people because who else would work in a prison than, than a dumb dumb? Uh, that I decided to file a FOIA request anyway, just to see if they would catch it. And they didn't catch it. And they actually responded to it quite quickly. Most of what they sent me was uh, stupid stuff, my own medical records, my own visitors list, things like that. But there were about a dozen pages that were very interesting and very important. They were internal memos about how to deal with me. Hmm. And there was one that was very simple and very important. And it was one page and it was written in very large block letters. And it was from the warden to all personnel in the prison. And it said, caution, inmate has access to the media. And that's really what the nature of this, of this problem for them was, that I had access to the media. Well, Julian is the media. And so imagine the lengths that they'll go to to silence Julian. Now, in my silly little position, all I had to do uh, was to smuggle my, I, I wrote a blog uh, regularly called Letters from Loretto that I, I turned into a book when I got home, but I, I would just simply smuggle it out with other prisoners, or I would sw smuggle it out through one of my attorneys, the whistleblower attorney, Jessalyn Radak. Um, and it was easy enough. Marty Gottesfeld can't get anything out of that prison. And certainly if Julian uh, were in the U.S. penitentiary at Terre Haute, they would be on him like white on rice, as we say here in the States. He wouldn't be able to communicate with anybody. But that's the point. The point isn't just to punish him. The point is to punish him and to silence him. Because when you silence him, he can't get that message out. And so people like us remain uninformed. We don't know what's going on. We can't push that message of truth and transparency and openness because we just don't have access to it. That's the point. Now, it, we're lucky in the respect, and, Je, and uh, Julian is lucky in the respect that, um, that the Justice Department is going to have to justify, legally justify its own prison system. And it's unjustifiable. And so I think that's where the victory is for Julian. I think the, the US put itself in a corner that it can't get out of, where they would have to convince the, the Court of Appeals and perhaps the Supreme Court and perhaps the uh, European Court of Justice that no, there's nothing wrong with the US prison system. Not only will Julian get a fair hearing in the United States, they'll argue, but when he's convicted and he will be convicted because you know, the justice system isn't just, uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, they'll they'll lock him up in a in a SAM unit. So for for the, Julian, in the event that this that he's not able to protect himself, and again, I think that he will be. Uh, the fix is in. There's no justice here. Yeah. Um. Thanks, John. One of the things um, that was visible through the hearings was the fact that Julian had been moved to the medical unit at Belmarsh, not because they were concerned seriously about his medical health, although his medical condition was serious in itself. They put him there to keep him out of reach of the kinds of cameras that were uh, revealing for prisoners who had taken footage of him, which got revealed on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, within Belmarsh. So um, talking about segregating people in order to not let them access the medias um, is not something that is that appears now to be unusual in British prisons either. Um, could I now take, um, I'm, I'm trying to draw in a couple of questions at a time from the audience, but one of the questions that I think needs a standalone answer is, um, could you give us some quotes from the different Stratfor leagues? And I'm, I'm hoping that Suelette might be able to share some of this with us. Well, yeah, I mean, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go the, ahead. The, oh, the, the emails do um, provide some insight into the psyche of the people in these 
privatized um, pseudo intelligence providing firms. Uh, so one of the messages reads, Assange is going to make a nice bride in prison. Screw the terrorist. He'll be eating cat food forever unless George Soros hires him. Um, and uh, interestingly, there's information in some of the other ones that's quite telling. So one of them is reporting on um, uh, him being arrested and due to appear in a court in Westminster soon to face charges of rape accused by two women in Sweden, quote, charges of sexual assault rarely are passed through Interpol red notices like this one. So this is no doubt about trying to disrupt WikiLeaks release of government documents. Um, and and then they talk about you know whether it could disrupt the long term viability um, of WikiLeaks. Then there's a, a sort of long discussion between a set of people um, about uh, whether or not a, the the deaths in Iraq are comparable to Pearl Harbor, um, and and they're actually putting counts in the email. Well, there were you know Pearl Harbor had. 2,400, you know, and two military killed and 57 civilians killed, whereas, you know, in or the U.S. fatalities in Iraq were, were 4,429 and 179 U.K. fatalities. And, and, and the argument that goes back and forth in this email is, but it took, and I'm quoting, I'm so excuse my French, but it took years of fucking up to get to that point in Iraq. <laughs> Pearl, Pearl wasn't even a single day, it was a single morning. And, and so the, the mentality here is, it seems very at odds with what the public would think was, you know, acceptable about justifying, um, you know, trying to, to stop a war. It's like, well, it took longer to kill all these civilians and people in Iraq, and therefore it's not okay to actually um, uh, report on it. Another amusing entry was, um, uh, a comment really on how they view, I guess, their clients um, in Washington, the foggy bottom bow ties have their panties in a knot over a specific Iraq cable outed yesterday, not sure which one may be yanked. So that's a <laughs> clearly not, not very complimentary perspective they have on the people who pay their bills. Um, did you have a couple of ones you wanted to mention, John? Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in and cut you off. No, actually, I was going to talk about some of the same things. Uh, you know, it seems to me that that these little embarrassing snippets of information that were released uh, <laughs> were not as embarrassing to them as uh, as the fact that they lost all their, their customers' credit card numbers and they had to go back and, and apologize to everybody. And it, it, they were they were embarrassed and they were humiliated and they wanted to take it out on uh, on Jeremy Hammond. So I you know, should, they, they, I, should, they, I should add to that that um, please do. What one of the one of the um, companies whose credit card numbers was leaked was the law firm of um, the judge's husband, the judge who presided over Jeremy Hammond's um, criminal conviction. So, uh, in in any barely functioning world, this, she would have had to recuse herself, and 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 it kind of just speaks to the fact that it's such this incestuous relationship between these um, entities and and the people that are supposed to be you know uh, keeping an eye on them. Thanks, uh, Lowry. Could I just move back to something we talked about uh, with Suelette, which is the normalization of war that comes from the use of intelligence agencies such as this and what WikiLeaks did to kind of bash through that barrier and uh, remind us about, uh, you know, we talk about Black Lives Matter, but actually when people have died in Iraq and Afghanistan, that doesn't seem to count. So um, I, I wondered, uh, Ian, if you would like to comment on some of the normalization of war and how whistleblowing and WikiLeaks and, um, helps to um, help to surface that, please. Thanks, Deepa. Yeah, I think uh, a, a very important aspect of uh, this particular case, uh, if you look at Stratfor, the Stratfor leaks, a lot of it, some of its clients, of course, uh, uh, big companies, but a lot of them are actually uh, military uh, companies, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, Raytheon, and so on. And uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, if you think of the, not just the military budget, but the intelligence budget, a lot of it is outsourced to 
uh, private contractors. Uh, Edward Snowden, for example, was working for a private contractor when he blew the whistle on uh, global mass surveillance and, and so on. And uh, WikiLeaks itself, as uh, Laurie has highlighted, it's a public, it's a, uh, an intelligence agency for the public. It's a public interest, as it were, intelligence agency. And that many of the whistleblowers who were going to visit WikiLeaks were in fact uh, um, members of the uh, in, former UK and US uh, intelligence community uh, who, who had um, blown the whistle on uh, corrupt actions that they had witnessed, uh, such as Mr. Kiriakou, and bravely come out and spoke about this and then, and then got uh, interested in the work of WikiLeaks uh, subsequently. And I remember um, an event a few years ago, which uh, uh, John Kiriakou and um, uh, Robert Thibault and uh, uh, Craig Murray, all very courageous uh, whistleblowers and, uh, and so on. So, uh, they talked about their own circumstances, but they made a very big uh, and important uh, message to the audience that, that the work of WikiLeaks is vital, even though their cases were not necessarily directly linked at that time. Uh, and I hadn't really made that, that link at that time, just it is a historic case because, um, as has been mentioned before, it's related to the criminalized, you know, if this happens, if this goes through, Julian Assange gets prosecuted, then this is the end of journalism. Because it, this is, this is a, this is a journalist that was actually doing what all the other newspapers weren't doing. And in, in, in 2001, I think there was this, there was been a massive sea change in global politics and it's associated with the war on terror. And essentially it's the normalization of war. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would describe it as you just said. And, and that means that um, if you look at The Guardian, for example, uh, which generally does very good uh, articles about things like climate change, uh, gender discrimination and, and all sorts of good stuff. But if you look at it, it, it you know, it's published so many, uh, it's given a lot of time to Tony Blair, I think 75 articles, either interviews or basically press releases. <laughs> um, since, you know, this guy, this guy was responsible for um, this whole way in which a very strange man, President George W. Bush decided to go and bomb a, a country unrelated to 9-11 in response to 9-11. And, and since then, there's been a whole bunch of other wars of racist wars of aggression uh, against other, com other countries. And very few journalists are challenging this, but WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks challenges this. Not only that, it, it, through the work of whistleblowers, insiders who know what's going on, it reveals the dynamics which other journalists for whatever reason I'm doing. And I think this is, it's, a, it's crucial, you know, this, this work is so vital, not just for investigative journalism generally, but also for this dreadful turn from 2001 onwards, uh, this sort of increased militarization of the internet, this, 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 this general normalization of war in the, in the media, and people who call out, uh, you know, are concerned about anti-war activists and human rights activists, they get tracked by these companies, they get smeared by these um, private intelligence organizations, they get tracked, surveyed by them, and they get, the, there's an attempt to discredit, discredit them. And, and again, Julian Assange has become this, this center, the absolute sort of epicenter of this, this, um, this struggle. And I think, yeah, this, this really is an, uh, of historic importance, basically, this case. Thanks, Ian. Um, can I just move back to you, John, to ask, uh, before I come round to all the speakers for closing comments, to ask a question which has come from the audience, which is not actually a question, it's a comment. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the writer sends uh, greetings from the Peace and Neutrality Ireland, uh, Alliance in Ireland and says that they, as a civil servant, as a, for, or as a retired civil servant, they don't share the general view about whistleblowers. And they have known cases where whistleblowers made mistakes. Um, this particular individual knew the mistaker and the mistake he is, he refers to him. Um, the reason he supports Julian Assange is because he exposed criminal behavior by the US government. And he, he says that does require exposure, but, and this is the, the controversial bit, at least for me, is that in general, I have reservations about whistleblowing. And I'd like to bring in John, Suelet and Ian about that, if I, if I may. Um, and if you could comment on that, John. You know, on, on uh, the, the day that I met 
Jessel and Radak. It was about four days after my arrest. Uh, I had read some quotes that Jesselyn had given to the Washington Post, and uh, I had never met her, and I wanted to thank her for supporting me in public. So I called her at something like six o'clock in the morning. I thought I would just leave a message, and, uh, and she answered her phone. And I introduced myself, and she said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that you've been arrested. Why don't you come to my office and let's meet? So I went to her office a few hours later. I was there for two hours, and she agreed to take my case and to help me. And on the way out, I said to her, I want to thank you so much because I know that you only represent whistleblowers and I'm not a whistleblower. And she said, but you are a whistleblower. And I said, no, I'm not. I, I'm just a regular guy who just happened to see something um, that I objected to. And, and I, I said something publicly. And she said, no whistleblower thinks he's a whistleblower but there's a legal definition of whistleblowing and that is bringing to light any evidence of waste few uh, sorry of waste fraud abuse illegality or threats to the public health or public safety and she said that's what you did you're the poster boy for whistleblowing well that was a revelation to me and one of the other things that i learned in this whole process is that oftentimes well most of the time whistleblowing is not really a clean process Sometimes the whistleblower is really not a compelling figure. Uh, it's somebody who's hard to like, uh, but that shouldn't matter. All that should matter is the information that is revealed. One of the other things that I learned is motivation for whistleblowing is irrelevant. All that's relevant is the information. Does the information meet those requirements? of exposing waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety. Once I understood that and accepted that, it was far easier for me to appreciate what it was that so many different whistleblowers around the world were coming forward with. You don't have to like the whistleblower. You don't ha even have to agree with the whistleblower. You just have to respect the information. Thanks, John. Um so, Alette, Ian, did you want to come in on that, or sh um, should we move to final comment? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Ian, Ian, would you like to go first? After you, Celeste. Oh, I think I might just sort of jump to to some final comments, if I if I might, um, and 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 it's a little bit upbeat in this sense. So one of the Stratford males in uh, the publication um, wrote, certainly the DOJ have a poster case for a range of criminal indictments to include the death penalty for Assange. Manning will be deep fried. Uh, I think it, one of the other things that comes out in these emails uh, is Stratford saying, mm, we might, we could maybe take the man down but it, it may not be possible to kill off this thing he's created, this WikiLeaks thing that he's created. And by that, they meant not just the organization, but a way of thinking, um, a new way of thinking and a new set of actions. Uh, and, I, and I think that in a positive sense, their fear was well-founded. Uh, and that's because although Julian has spent what, more than seven years in one form or another, um, in either prisons or um, not having his freedom and under deep constraint. In that time, we've seen things like um, Italian journalist Stefania Marazzi uh, running a court case um, around WikiLeaks related information that was being um, sought through FOI. The Met had been blocking just as a tactic and uh, took the matter to an upper court on appeal and won overturning a lower court's bad decision. Um, and that resulted in an important finding for all journalists access to information. We've seen more than a hundred secure drop boxes rolled out around the world, not just in support of anti-war movements or general reporting about corruption, but uh, protecting um, environmental crimes, uh, uh, protecting um, COVID 
uh, related, I mean, not crimes, but, you know, fighting environmental crimes, fighting uh, COVID supply chain and uh, other crimes, um, immediate threat to safety, political corruption, um, all sorts of, of areas of both specialty in field, specialty in geography. Um, that, that is now such a mainstream idea that it's, it's de rigueur in most major reputable media organizations. That was Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. They invented that. Um, dozens of countries around the world have in the last decade adopted whistleblower protection laws and thousands of organizations have done so often required by law, including uh, first laws that applied federally here in Australia in 2012, 13, and then most recently in the last two years, laws that applied to the private sector. Um, and, and then we'll see these 27 countries rolled out by the end of 2021 across all of the EU with whistleblower protection laws. Some of them, such as in countries like Spain, where there has been literally no standalone whistleblower protection law anywhere in Spain. Um, in fact, what we've seen is improved cybersecurity for journalists, both an awareness of their own need for cybersecurity, training that's offered through civil society, specialist education, universities, reaching out to journalists. I set up training for uh, journalists in the master's program at, at my university um, and, and a growing awareness that the fact that the journalists not only have to defend themselves, they've got to defend their sources when it comes to the technology as well. Um, and, and a lot of information laid bare so that the public is not only less deceived, but less trusting of these information companies that are linked to the defense industry, to the lies that politicians may tell us to get reelected in support of going to war yet again to cover up um, some financial or other malfeasance they would like the attention diverted from. And finally, and most importantly, um, the profound change that has happened over the last decade, whereby whistleblower is no longer a dirty word. It is no longer a dibby dauber. It is no longer a rat. It is actually a justice seeker, you know, and increasingly uh, I'm, I make the argument and, and I hear it reflected back in what people are saying that whistleblowing is seen as an emerging type of human right within the freedom of expression right that we have. Um, UN Declaration of Human Rights. It is the right to dissent from wrongdoing. It's a right that was established not for whistleblowers per se, but for people as a whole after World War II in Europe, when we decided that no, it was not okay to just stand by and say, mm, I didn't say anything about what I saw that was happening that was so awful. No, that wasn't acceptable, say the courts, say the people. And, and now we see this translated into a different mentality in how whistleblowers are viewed. And I think that WikiLeaks and indeed these, uh, these publications as a part of WikiLeaks' activities have played a role in that transition in all of those key achievements. Thank you, Sulet. Um, Ian, did you want to continue there? And then we'll go to La Laurie and John. Yeah, very quick point. Uh, so uh, Michael Clark does make very clear in, in his comment that um, he very strongly supports uh, the, the work of Julian Assange in, and the uh, because he revealed uh, evidence of criminal behavior by the US government in its conduct of war and other matters. So so that's very important. And, and, uh, uh, and then he's subsequently said, what about uh, but what happens when a whistleblower that gets it wrong, which which may be the case, and in fact there has been a recent case, quite an interesting one, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where there were two sort of the initial whistleblowers, Chris Wiley, who was uh, briefly, uh, I think, director of research for it, and, and then there was another whistleblower uh, who the documentary, the Great Hack, was done on Brittany Kaiser, uh, and they both have very different versions of events, in fact, uh, but uh, which is quite interesting because having you can sort of compare and contrast there. They both wrote memoirs about it. Um, but the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, I think uh, late last year, uh, published a, a report where basically they said, in fact, Cambridge Analytica didn't work for the Brexit campaign, for example. Uh, that was their finding. Although there'd been a huge number of front page uh, sort of stories about Cambridge Analytica's role in Brexit, the, the UK 
Information Commissioner's Office found, well, that wasn't the case. And, and you do get, uh, but I think uh, these are these are interesting peculiarities, but on the whole, the work of whistleblowers, if you think of the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, much of what we know about the financial crisis came from whistleblowers um, who were whose lives also were destroyed uh, uh, as a result of their blowing a the whistle on their companies. Often they were quite senior people. Uh, if you think of you know, so financial misconduct, uh, military misconduct, intelligence uh, misconduct, Edward Snowden's whistleblowing, all sorts of forms of corporate and uh, government misconduct that we now know of, we know of, we only know of, but we know the details because of the work of whistleblowers. So we, you can't, you know, it's it's impossible to undervalue that huge public service the public interest whistleblowers provide for, to us. Thanks, Ian. And over to you, Lowry, now for some closing comments. Larry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I've got it. I've got it. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, how can I wrap up? Um, we 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 are aware, I think, painfully aware of the emergence of the national security state, um, the normalisation of war, the uh, normalisation of conflicts, uh, elective conflicts of aggression, and the um, sub subornment, the uh, co-option of the press into supporting these. Um, but we are aware of the countervailing tendency, and that is the the, um, the wider network, the, the public, the networked individuals that form the polity, that form civil society, realizing that they retain a role and they can participate in this oversight capacity. Um, and um, where there is a concerted will to shine the light of transparency on um, the doings that would like prefer to be done in back rooms and uh, in, in the smoky darkness where they can get away with all sorts. And um, that concerted will will bring things to light. Um, and, you know, it's, um, we, we, we will continue to fight for Julian Assange and I'm confident he will not be extradited and they will not win this um, uh, victory and exert this chilling effect um, against um, the public's uh, involvement in transparency and its requirements to have transparency. But, um, you know, I was just want to say to the, the you know the powers that be and and and, and to the media that um, the, in general that uh, well I, I want to use the analogy of one of the uh, pioneers of cyberspace, um, uh, John Gilmore, who famously said um, the net the network interprets censorship as damage and roots around it, and um, so if you're in the press, if you're willing to um, take on that responsibility then the, the network, the, the internet will work with you. And if you're not willing to take on that responsibility, we'll work around you. And that's what Wikipedia did. And I, I'll, I'll put, leave with the uh, words of my revolutionary comrade who goes by the name of Ice-T in a song that he wrote called Ain't a Damn Thing Changed. And he says, um, ban me, try it. You might cause a riot. What the radio won't play, the underground will supply it. John, Amen. over to you now for some final comments. I, I think I'll, I'll close by saying that uh, in 2015, uh, Sulet hired me to uh, help the Greek government write a, a new whistleblower protection law. And in my very first trip that year, um, in a meeting with the Minister of Justice, uh, we were speaking in Greek and there is no word in Greek for whistleblower. And so finally the minister said to me, what exactly is this word you keep using, whistleblower? So I explained to him what I meant. And he said, ah, like a rat or a snitch. And I said, no, not at all like a rat or a snitch. And so we had a long conversation and we came up with the term sentinel of the public trust, which is a very pretty word in Greek. Um, sentinel of the public trust. Uh, and that's the word that we continue to use throughout the process. So my, my point here is we have a lot of work to do, uh, a lot of work. We can't let up, we can't stop. We have to, look, we're, we're right and we're the good guys. And so we have to keep the fight up, whether it's in support of Julian or in support of Jeremy Hammond or in support of Anonymous or WikiLeaks as an organization, we have to we have to keep up the fight. 
Thanks, John. Thank you very much. And to all those of you who um, we had expected to go for 90 minutes and we've gone for slightly longer than that. Thank you for those who've stayed throughout. Uh, we haven't had a single drop in the viewing. Um, but also, um, you know, the Free the Truth events were intended to bring people like Suolette, John and Lowry to, uh, to the public to allow us to hear and understand what's really going on in the world and to look beyond the superficial narratives that are spun in, in some of the media and to look to understand what true journalism, true whistleblowing and the true public interest is about. And we will continue to have these events. The next event is likely to be about Guantanamo. Um, it's, a, it's a rescheduled event, which was going to mark um, 19 years of uh, Guantanamo being open. Um, and so that's going to um, take place next. And um, I urge you to please follow us, follow the Don't Extradite Assange page. Please support Stella's campaign to raise funds for the, um, for the defense of Julian. And uh, first also a big thank you to Gareth Pierce and those at Burnburg Pierce who are, uh, and in the other legal teams, including um, at Doughty Street and elsewhere who are doing a huge amount of work um, not at the extraordinary rates that some of these people charge, but at, at very uh, reasonable rates in order to be able to push forward this case and who've been working day and night to get Julian released. We are behind you, we support you, and uh, we hope to see Julian amongst us and perhaps speaking on at one of the Free the Truth panels very soon. Uh, and uh, on that note, thank you to all our speakers and to the Committee to Defend Julian Assange who helped uh, fund the Zoom to our technical experts and to our um, to the I, I, I hesitate to call them this but media partners who are uh, actually uh, retweeting and sharing the information to all of you who are viewing and have supported these events and we look forward to having many more such discussions thank you bye bye